Hello. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about some of the changes related to consonant sounds in early modern English. I'm going to begin by talking about the development of some new phonemes in this period. Um, and the first one I want to talk about is the velar nasal, the ung sound. You may remember that um, the ung sound, the velar nasal ung, has been around in in English um, from the beginning. So in Old English and Middle English, you had this sound, ung, but it existed only as an allophone of the alveolar or dental N sound. So when that N sound appeared before a velar stop, a ka or a ga, then the N will be pronounced as a velar ung, right? So the Old English word to drink was brinken with an ng before the ka, and the Old English word for song was songa with a n before an ng before a g sound. This changed so that in early modern English we have the situation we have today where the ng velar nasal is a separate distinct phoneme. So it uh, can occur but doesn't have to occur before velar nasals, right? So you can get it before velar nasal in a word like drink or you can have it by itself in a word like song, ng, right? And so the question uh, to ask here is, how did we get from this situation where it was an, al an al allophone of N to the situation we have today where it's a separate phoneme? And it really is related to some sound changes that happened in the early modern English period, particularly sound change that affected the sequence velar nasal N plus G at the ends of words. So that's what final means at the ends of words. So when it occurred in a stressed syllable, or a single syllable word, of course, would always be stressed, the unga sequence was simplified by dropping the G so that the ung was by itself. So um, Middle English word like thing comes to be pronounced thing. Sung becomes sung with just a ng, a velar nasal. In unstressed syllables, that same sequence uh, was simplified to an N sound there, right? So um, a word like nothing becomes nothing. A word like chilling becomes chillin. And of course that's interesting because that ing syllable is very frequently pronounced as an in today. As a result of this, uh, these changes, particularly the one affecting stress syllables, a new phoneme uh, occurs, right? Ing becomes a separate phoneme because now it's in contrast with the n sound. Right? Contrast being a distinctive sound is a key diagnostic for being a separate phoneme. So now you have pairs of words like thing versus thin, velar nasal versus alveolar nasal, or sung versus sun, and those are two different words. The only phonological difference is a velar nasal versus an alveolar nasal, and so um, they're in contrast. That's what it takes to be a separate phoneme. We have another new phoneme that appears in early modern English, and this one is a fricative. You remember um, the fricative situation. We talked about this in the transition between Old and Middle English, where you acquired new voiced fricatives. Um, but Old English actually had uh, four different uh, fricatives. We talked about the acquisition of voiced fricatives uh, v, the, and z for the labial, dental, interdental, and alveolar places of articulation. But there was a fricative in Old English, sh, spelled with an sc, and that uh, in Middle English did not have a voiced uh, partner, right? There was a blank space there, no uh, friend for sh to play with, while the other voiceless fricatives all had voiced friends. Um, of course, if you remember your phonetics, you'll know what fricative should go in that blank, and that is the j sound, right? So the voiced equivalent of sh would be a j. And so the question begin, uh, becomes, how did English get this j phoneme that we have today? Um, and there's really two uh, factors that play into this. First, um, as you probably guessed, because j sounds like a super French sound, at least it does to me, um, there's lots of French words that came into English in the Middle English period that had the j sound, because that's a native sound of French, and then when they were brought into English, they retained that sound. So you have words like beige and genre and liege and so forth with the je sound. So when those words were borrowed and they kept that je sound, that introduced the je sound into English. 
There's also an internal sound change that happened around the 17th century. It's known as assibilation. It comes from the Latin word for whistling. Um, and we'll talk more about the details of this later, but basically it was a change that meant that when you had a z, a z, next to a y inside of a word, that they sort of smushed together to become a j sound. So a word like cizir with a z plus a z, y becomes cizir, and vision becomes vision. Again, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. One way of thinking about changes that happened in early modern English is thinking about the consequences that they had for English spelling. Right? One of the things we know is that English spelling is um, not particularly direct in its representation of uh, pronunciation, or rather the relationship between pronunciation and spelling um, is often rather indirect. One of the main contributors to this is the presence of several silent letters. So if you think about a word like which, um, there's that first H in which, which doesn't really correspond to any pronunciation, except you know for those few people who might pronounce this as which, with a hu sound there. Similarly, in a word like ni, you have a silent K. In words like talk and maybe calm, you have a silent L. And in a word like castle, you have a silent T. Right? All these silent letters, um, letters that are written but not pronounced, um, are there, and they're there for a uh, because of certain consonant changes in early modern English. In essence, they're there because they used to be pronounced, and we still write them because, basically, we still write the Middle English pronunciation of words rather than the uh, modern English pronunciation of words. Let's look at some consonant changes that will help explain how we came to have several of these silent letters. Um, for the silent H in a word like which, that's a... Uh, related to this process of initial consonant clusters being reduced. Initial just means at the beginning of a word. So when you had a hua, that's the traditional pronunciation of a word like which, uh, that H is dropped. In words like, uh, uh, that began with a gna or a kna, uh, words like gnat and kne in Middle English become nat and ni by just dropping the K or G sound and having the word start with a nasal. Similarly, the L is dropped uh, under certain conditions, specifically when it comes after a low vowel and it comes before a labial or velar consonant. So you can see this in the silent L in a word like talk. So that L used to be pronounced in Middle English. It might be something like talk, and that comes to be pronounced just as talk. Right? Similarly, palm with an L comes to be pronounced as palm. Ah, but you might say, wait a second. I don't say palm. I say palm. And that's actually true. There's quite a bit of variation in these words. Look at these words here, calm, balm, folk, uh, yoke, golf, and so forth. You might pronounce them with an L. You might not pronounce them with an L. Um, certainly in a word like calm, I think it's pretty common to have an L. Maybe less so in a word like balm. Um, uh, in yoke, I, I don't often hear people say an L, but I suppose it's, it's theoretically possible. In golf, probably most Americans at least would probably say the L in that, although it's common to hear it without that, uh, to hear it as something like golf. So the L is still written in all these words, um, and sometimes it's pronounced and sometimes it's not pronounced. The reason that it's sometimes pronounced is because we continued to write it, and then eventually people started to base their pronunciation on the uh, written form of the word. This is a phenomenon called spelling pronunciation, where you alter the pronunciation to be more in line with the spelling, which is sort of the backwards way that this normally works, but it's a very common process um, in literate societies. Another consonant change uh, was the dropping of the t and duh sounds when they occurred in consonant clusters, whether in the middle of words and sometimes at the ends of words. So if you look at words like handsome, right, that D in the middle of handsome used to be pronounced, um, but of course not, it's not pronounced today. Similarly, in a word like wrestle, the T is not usually pronounced, um, but historically it would have been pronounced as something like wrestle. Often is another um, case where that T is written, um, but not pronounced. Well, actually, it's sometimes pronounced, and you might be one of those people who says often with a T, um, but that's another example of a spelling pronunciation, right? That T was actually dropped hundreds of years ago, but because it continues to be spelled, people will often pronounce it, right? 
So you say uh, often there. Notice um, if you think of another word like, like soften, the verb soften, you never pronounce the T in soften. At least I hope you don't. Soften. Mm, that sounds terrible. Fabric softener. Ugh. Um, uh, as I said, that's internally in the middle of words, but it also is a phenomenon that applies to the ends of words. So you might um, pronounce the word N-E-X-T, you might pronounce that as nex, right, without the final T there. And I know you're saying, no, I always pronounce the T in next, um, but I'm not so sure about that. In fact, this is a very common um, process that happens in all varieties of English around the world, um, and that is where that T or D sound at the end of words, when it's in a cluster of, of consonants, so two or more consonants at the end of a word with a T or D at the end, that T or D might be dropped. It's more likely to be dropped when the T or D um, ends a word and the following word begins with a consonant than when the following word begins with a vowel. So if you say a phrase like next October, you're likely to pronounce the T, whereas you're likely to drop the T in a, in a phrase like next week because the uh, following word week begins with a consonant. Similarly, you might say field of dreams and keep the D in field, um, but if you say field goal, you might drop the D because it's before a consonant. This is a very common phenomenon in um, varieties of English all around the world. Another change relates to these um, fricatives, the palatal ch and the velar ch sound. You might recall these are allophones of the H phoneme from Old English, so they survive um, from Old English into Middle English. In Early Modern English, they change. In some cases, they're dropped completely. So if you take a word like the Middle English word bricht, uh, the ch the is there, um, represented by the spelling gh, that ch drops out, so you get bricht goes to bricht, goes, sorry, bricht goes to brit, and then eventually that vowel lengthens, so it becomes brit, and then it goes through the great vowel shift and becomes bright, right? But the key is the consonant represented by the gh is lost completely. In other environments, in other cases, that, that fricative is not dropped completely, but rather changed to a different fricative to an F sound. So the Middle English word tuch becomes tuf and eventually tough. Um, there. We talked about this change briefly earlier, this process known as assibilation or palatalization. Um, it's where the alveolar sound combines with the palatal glide and produces a um, alveopalatal fricative or affricate. So we talked about it in the case of a, a z becoming a z, but you can see it also applies to the voiceless combination. Z becomes sh, so ocean becomes ocean. Um, the z to z, as seen in usual, becomes usual with a z there. The t plus a y, as in creature, becomes a ch, so creature becomes creature, and the d or the d becomes a j, so gradual becomes gradual with a j sound there. One final change is the loss of r. Um, this began probably as early as the 15th century. The r was lost when it appeared before an s sound. Um, and what's interesting about this is there are some surviving pairs of words um, that sort of reflect this. So sometimes the r was dropped and then it was restored in other in varieties of English that still have the R, like American English. Right, so we have the word curse. Well, the word curse is related to the word cuss, right? You think about cursing and cussing, those are obviously related. Um, the cuss form re represents that change when the R was dropped, and then it was sort of res restored in a word like curse for, for dialects like ours that, that keep the R sound. Similarly, burst versus bust, and horse versus hoss. You might not not be familiar with Haas, but it's a uh, kind of a nickname often um, that's sometimes used, a Haas. Later on, uh, the R was dropped in other environments, namely after back vowels, so a word like quarter might come to be pronounced as quarter, right? or morning might be morning. Right? And then eventually, um, uh, the R is dropped really before any consonant or at the ends of words. And of course this doesn't apply to all varieties of English. It's most probably for most Americans associated with standard British English. So if you think about how a British speaker might say 
the word that we say is records, they would say records, right? With the records. And brother, they might say is something like brother, right? With an uh sound there, right? So that dropping of the R in a general context is something that affects um, certain dialects of English. And we'll have more to say about that later on this semester. Finally, just to return to that question about English uh, spelling, and one other reason why English spelling is so challenging, let's say, um, is uh, due to a kind of a fact that many words were respelled in the early modern English period because of their classical influence, because of their associations with Latin and Greek. So take a word like phantom, right? Phantom spelled with a PH. Um, when the word was originally came into English, it came in through French in the Middle English period, and it was spelled with an F, as is a very sensible way to spell a word that sounds like phantom. It was spelled with an F. But what happened is in the early modern period, thanks to the Renaissance, when people became obsessed with Greek and Latin, they realized that this word was originally from the Greek word that was spelled with a PH, and so they respelled the English version of it to spell phantom with a PH. And that's true for, for all of these examples here, right? So air, when it was originally um, uh, borrowed was not spelled with an H, and of course that H is not pronounced, um, but they realized that it comes from a Latin word that starts with an H, and so they started writing it. The B in debt is a similar history. The P in receipt has a similar history. Neither of those was ever pronounced. They were just written because they were associated with the Latin roots. Um, falcon, um, I think most Americans say the L in falcon, um, uh, but when it was originally borrowed from French, that L was not written, but it was from a Latin word, and so it w the L was reinserted in the spelling there. Similarly, the T in mortgage um, has never been pronounced in English, um, but it was written there because it's associated with the Latin, uh, the Latin root mort, uh, which is related to death. The last example there is probably the most interesting one, the word island, which we spell with an S. Um, in Middle English, this word was not spelled with an S, um, but it came to be spelled with an S because of its association with the Latin word for island, insula. What's interesting about that example is the English word island does not derive from the Latin word insula. They're not related at all, um, but they um, are sort of similar enough that people thought that they might be related, so they started writing the English word island with an S to reflect this fake uh, borrowing from Latin. And that's just another one of the reasons why English spelling is so difficult, so challenging. Um, but of course, it's preserved by the industry that funds big spelling bee, a lot of money in spelling bees, controlled by an Eastern syndicate, I'm told. Anyway, until next time.